In this lecture, we're going to look at another tool that will help us compute dimensions of vector spaces. Specifically, we're going to look at a method for computing the dimension of a span of column vectors. The problem we're looking to solve, therefore, is given some column vectors v1 up to vn, how can we find a basis, and hence the dimension, of their span, which we will call s? The method, which we're going to prove works, is as follows. First of all, you write the vectors as rows. The reason to do this is because we're going to use row operations, and we know about row operations already. We could define column operations, so we wouldn't have to turn our column vectors into row vectors, but rather than take the time to do that, we'll simply work with what we already know, which is row operations. So to explain what's going on here, if your vectors were v1 equal to 1, 2, and v2 equal to 3, 4, then the matrix A you would form would have as its first row v1, or v1 transposed to 1, 2, and its second row would be the entries of v2, so 3, 4. So that's what's going on with step one. In step two, we do row operations until we attain a matrix in row reduced echelon form. As we're going to prove on the next slide, when we do this, so when we do row operations to a matrix, we don't change the span of the rows of that matrix. That means that the span of our vectors v1 up to vn will be the same as the span of the rows of the row reduced echelon form matrix we end up with. Finally, once we've finished that step, we can then read off the answer because as we're going to show the non-zero rows of this row reduced echelon form matrix will be a basis for the span of the original vectors v1 up to vn once we transpose them back to being column vectors, of course. Let's look then at why when we do row operations to a matrix we don't change the span of the rows of the matrix. To talk about this, we're going to use a definition, which is that the row space of a matrix A is defined to be the span of the rows of A, and equally, although we're not going to use it in this lecture, the column space of a matrix A is defined to be the span of the columns of A. The result we're interested in proving is that when you do row operations to a matrix, you don't change the span of the rows of that matrix. In other words, if you have a matrix A, and if you have another matrix, which is obtained from A by doing a row operation, let's call the new matrix B, then the row space for A is equal to the row space for B. So generalizing this a little bit, and remembering the three different types of row ops, what well, that's equivalent to saying is the following lemma. If you have row op if you have vectors r1 up to rm in a vector space v, and if you have two numbers i not equal to j, and if you have a non-zero scalar lambda and a scalar mu, which can be anything, then the span of r1 up to rm is equal to the span of r1 uh, up to lambda times ri, and then ri plus 1 up to rm. So the reason for looking at this result is because the first type of row operation multiplies a row ri by lambda times in, into lambda times ri, where lambda is not zero. Now, if these r's were the rows of a matrix, then the span on the left here would be the row space of that matrix, and the span on the right here would be the row space of the matrix obtained by doing this row operation to that matrix. So the first part of this lemma is telling you that when you do the first type of row operation to a matrix, you don't change its row space. The second type of row operation is the row operation which swaps two rows, so let's say Ri and Rj, 
And the second part of our lemma says that if you have the span of R1 up to Rm, then that's the same as the span as R1 up to Rm, only with Rj and Ri in different places. So again, if you had a matrix A whose rows were R1 up to Rm, then the span on the right would be the row space of the matrix obtained by doing the row operation to A, which swaps row I and row J. And finally, the third type of row operation takes row I and replaces it with row I plus l mu times Rj, where I must be different to J, and mu can be any element of the field over which V is a vector space. The third part of the lemma would tell you that the span on the left, which is the row space of some matrix A, would be equal to the row space of the matrix obtained by doing this third type of row operation to A. So all in all, the lemma would tell you that if you do any type of row operation to a matrix A, then the row space of A is the same as the row space of the matrix that you get by doing a row operation to A. So doing any sequence of row ops will not change the row space. We're going to prove two out of these three, and one of them will be uh, on your midterm problem sheet. It will be a discussion question on your midterm problem sheet. Let's look at number one. We have to show that two spans are equal, and in order to show that these two spans are equal, we'll show that the first span is a subset of the second span, and the second span is a subset of the first span. So let's let... Um, v be a vector in the first span. The definition of the span is that it is the set of all linear combinations of R1 up to Rm. So we can write v as lambda 1 times r1 plus and so on up to lambda i times ri and then up to lambda m plus times rm where the lambdas here are just some elements of the field so some scalars We have to show that this is also an element of the right-hand side. In other words, this is also a linear combination of R1 up to Ri minus 1, and then lambda times Ri, and then Ri plus 1 up to Rm. But that's easy, because remember here, lambda is supposed to be a non-zero scalar. So I can just write this. I'm going to keep all of my terms the same, except when I get to the ith term, I'm going to write this as lambda i times lambda to the minus 1, that's allowed because lambda was non-zero, times lambda ri. And then I'm going to keep all the other terms the same. And this thing is visibly in the span of r1 up to ri minus 1, and then lambda times ri, and then up to rm. We've shown that every element of the left-hand side is in the right-hand side. Now we have to show that every element of the right-hand side is in the left-hand side. Let's take a vector u in the span of r1 up to ri minus 1, and then lambda times ri, and then ri plus 1 up to rm. So again, u is equal to a linear combination of those vectors, which we're going to write as u is equal to, let's say, mu1 times r1 up to mu i times lambda ri, and then mu i plus 1 times ri plus 1 all the way up to mu m times rm. Again, 
we can just rewrite this to make it obvious that it's a linear combination of R1 up to Rm. This is mu1 R1, leaving that first term alone. And when we get to the ith term, I'm just going to re-bracket it as mu i times lambda times r i. And then I'll leave all the other terms alone. Now the mu i's, remember, are just elements of our field, just some scalars. And when we rewrite it like this, we can see that this is a linear combination of r1 up to rm. So it's in the span of R1 up to Rm. We have now shown that for part 1, the left-hand side is contained in the right-hand side and the right-hand side is contained in the left-hand side. Therefore, they're equal. For part 2, is this time really obvious because in both cases, you have the same vectors in a different order. So... The reason that part 2 is true is simply because vector addition is always commutative. So you can simply rearrange an element of the span of the vectors on the left to see that it's also a span of the vectors on the right. Part 3 will follow from a result which is going to be a discussion question on your midterm. So some of you will present that question and learn how to do it then and explain it to the others. In any event, when I publish solutions to the midterm, you'll be able to see my solution to this result. So that will come later. In any case, once we have this lemma, we then know that doing a row operation to a matrix A does not change its row space, and therefore doing a sequence of row operations to a matrix doesn't change its row space. So in our procedure for finding a basis for the span of a sequence of vectors, which was to put those vectors as rows of a matrix and then do row reduced echelon and then do row operations to put that matrix into row reduced echelon form. The span of the, of the vectors which we were interested in is equal to the row space of the matrix we started off with, and that's the same as the row space of the row reduced echelon form matrix which we end up with. We're now going to show that actually the non-zero rows in a row reduced echelon form are going to be linearly independent. And that will prove that our procedure works because the non-zero rows will then be linearly independent, and by the argument we just made, they will span the row, the row space of the original matrix, which was the span of the vectors that we were interested in. So those non-zero rows will therefore be linearly independent and a spanning set for the span we were interested in. Therefore, there'll be a basis for the span we wanted to know about. Let's now prove this result saying that the non-zero rows in a row-reduced echelon form matrix are linearly independent. So we will let A be a... Actually, we'll give this a different name. Let capital R be a matrix which is in row-reduced echelon form. And we will let R1 up to Rk be its non-zero rows. I only want the non-zero rows here. Now, each non-zero row in a row reduced echelon form matrix contains a leading entry. We're going to write down some notation for the column number of the leading entry in row I. 
Remember what you know about row reduced echelon form. A column which contains a leading entry has all of its other entries equal to zero. That's what's going to make our proof work. Before we do the proof, let's write down just an example so that we can see the meaning of the notation in a concrete example. So perhaps in our example, R might be the matrix 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0. That is a row reduced echelon form matrix. There are two non zero rows, so in my notation k is equal to 2. R1 is the first non zero row, 0, 1, 0, 2. C1 is the number of the column with, with a leading entry in row 1. So C1 is 2 because this leading entry right here is in column 2. R2 is the second non-zero row, 0, 0, 1, 3. And C2 will be equal to 3 because the leading entry in, col in row 2 here is in column 3. OK. That's our example. Let's now go on and prove the claim. So let's suppose that we have a linear combination of the rows R1 up to Rk equal to the zero vector. So lambda 1, R1, plus, and so on up to lambda k r k and that that is equal to the zero vector which in our case is the column vector sorry the row vector all of whose entries are zero now we're going to consider a number i between 1 and k Remember, our job, because we're trying to show these, ro these rows are linearly independent, is to show that if we've got this linear combination of the rows equal to the zero vector, then actually all of the scalars lambda i must be equal to zero. So we'll do that one at a time uh, by fix thinking about a particular number i between 1 and k. So we're going to consider entry number ci of lambda 1, r1, and so on, up to lambda k, rk. ci was the column of the leading entry in row i. So every other row has a zero in that column. Therefore, in this linear combination, the only term which affects entry CI is lambda i times r i. But r i has a 1 in column c i. In a row reduced echelon form matrix, all leading entries are equal to 1. <laughs> 
So the ci entry of our linear combination, let's call it star, r, lambda 1 times r1 up plus lambda 2 times r2 up to lambda k times rk is just lambda i. But remember, this linear combination is equal to the zero row vector. So lambda i equals zero. That argument works for any i between 1 and k, and therefore we've shown all of the coefficients in that linear combination were equal to zero, which is what we need for linear independence. So again, if you want to see that in an example, let's return to our example on the right here. So then we had two non-zero rows, and if we work out lambda 1 times r1 plus lambda 2 times r2, that will be equal to 0 in the first place, and then in the second place, I get lambda 1 times 1 plus lambda 2 times 0. In the third place, I get lambda 2 times 0 plus lambda... Sorry, lambda 1 times 0 plus lambda 2 times 1. And in the, sec in the last place, well, I get a mess. I get lambda 1 times 2 plus lambda 2 times 3. Anyway, the point is that if we look at what happens in column C1, then as I said in the proof, you just get lambda 1. And if you look at what happened in C2, then because all the other entries in column 3 were 0, except for the 1 in row 2, we would get just a lambda 2 there. And so if this thing were equal to the 0 row vector, then I can immediately read off that lambda 1 must be 0 and lambda 2 must be 0. So in some sense, the non-zero rows of a row-reduced echelon form matrix are obviously linearly independent because when you write down a linear combination equal to the zero row vector, you can see straight away that the coefficients of that linear combination must be zero. OK, so that's why our method works. Let's now try applying it in an example. So here's an example. We have three vectors in R cubed, V1, V2, and V3, and those are the column vectors 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9. So we form a matrix A whose rows are the entries in those column vectors. So the first row comes from V1, it's 1, 2, 3. The second row comes from V2, and it's 4, 5, 6. And the third row comes from V3, and it's 7, 8, 9. Our procedure then told us to do row operations until we reached a matrix in row, row reduced echelon form. So what you should do now is pause the video and do row operations to the matrix A until you reach a matrix in row reduced echelon form. So do that now. OK, I hope you did it. Um, the answer that you should get is 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0. That's step 2 of our procedure for finding a basis for the span of V1, V2, and V3. And the final procedure was to read off the non-zero rows in the row-reduced echelon form. The non-zero rows correspond to column vectors 1, 0, minus 1, and 0, 1, 2. And this is a basis for the span of V1, V2, V3.